Hi, guys. So we are back with chapters 13 and 14 of Chomp. Oh, my gosh. After last time, when they told us what's going to happen to Derek Badger, I can't wait because he's kind of obnoxious. Wahoo was accustomed to his father's snoring, which sounded like a dump truck stripping its gears. That's not what awakened him. It was a dream about tuna. Her dad was furiously chasing her around the Walmart parking lot, and Wahoo was trying to tackle him so she could get away. In the dream, Tuna's father had no face, only a slab of pocked gray flesh where his mouth, nose, and eyes should have been. Wahoo's imagination simply couldn't picture a man who would try to harm his daughter that way. Wahoo crawled from his sleeping bag and emerged from the tent he shared with his father. A light rain had fallen overnight, and the sky remained overcast. The sun had been up for an hour, but the air beneath the tree canopy was cool and funky smelling from the exotic vegetation. In the distance, a great blue heron croaked defiantly. Mickey Cray arose with a series of wolverine snuffles. Anticipating a demand for hot coffee, Wahoo restarted the campfire. There was no breeze and the mosquitoes were delighted to see him. Tuna came out of her tent, mumbling a sleepy, good morning, and sat down cross-legged on the ground. Wahoo's father noticed a script in her hands and asked, What you reading, hun? Shakespeare, she answered, casually flipping over a script to hide the title page. I'm playing Ophelia in a summer production of Hamlet. Wahoo was impressed by her quick thinking and the classy-sounding fib. Shakespeare, huh? said Mickey, with no shred of interest. He reached for the pot of coffee. Hey, you wouldn't happen to have any more of those headache pills, would you? Tuna said, I'll trade you two of them for a cup of that java. Fair enough. Pour one for me, too, said Wahoo. Mickey laughed. Since when do you drink this stuff? Take your pills, Pop. Tuna suggested that they go get breakfast at the main camp, from which tantalizing smells wafted through the bay windows. Wahoo's father again insisted on cooking, a humble but tasty serving of bacon and powdered eggs. He said that dining with Derek Badger would ruin his appetite. Soon they heard airboats which meant that the crew of Expedition Survival was preparing to load the gear and ride to the location of the opening scene. Tuna, Wahoo, and Mickey hurried through the woods and joined up with the others, who were filling canteens with cold water from a 50-gallon cooler and stuffing their pockets with granola bars. Raven Stark was there, though Derek had not yet arrived. It took a while to pack the equipment and get everybody seated. Tuna, Wahoo, and his dad were assigned to ride with Link, who wasn't exactly overjoyed to see them. Not you, he growled from the driver's platform. Tuna gave a friendly little wave. Play nice, she said, and wedged herself between Wahoo and Mickey. Link poked Wahoo's father in the back. I keep my eye on you, we clear? Mickey ignored him. Wahoo looked up and said, we are absolutely clear. Clear as a church bell, Tuna added. The ride lasted longer than Wahoo had expected. The three airboats flattened pathways through a prairie of tall sawgrass that hadn't been crossed in a long time, at least not by humans. After almost an hour, the lead boat carrying the show's director halted at the edge of a wide-open pond that was teeming with dragonflies and waiting birds called purple gallinules. The other boat stopped in the same place, and all the passengers removed their earmuffs. A walkie-talkie attached to Link's belt began to crackle with instructions. Wahoo recognized the director's voice. Four minutes, he announced. Be ready. In the first boat, a captain cameraman scrambled to position himself on the bow. At the front of the second boat stood Raven, wearing a flamingo pink sun hat as wide as a sombrero. Derek Badger was nowhere to be seen. Where the heck is he? whispered Tuna. Mickey snickered. Wahoo pointed to an object in the sky. It was a helicopter, approaching rapidly from the east, the thwack-a-thwack of its rotors growing louder. He's going to do the jump, Tuna exclaimed. Sweet! Parachuting into the wilderness was one of Derek's signature moves, although other TV survivalists occasionally used the same stunt. The difference was that Derek insisted on jumping from the aircraft while blindfolded. This was not only dumb, but also pointless, as Wahoo's father remarked whenever they watched the program. The chopper slowed down until it froze in a hover high above the fleet of airboats. A familiar-looking figure could be seen at the open door, his boots braced on the skid. Poised beside him was another man aiming a video camera. Five, said the voice coming over Link's handheld radio. Four, three, two, one, and action. The figure let go of the helicopter and dropped free, spreading his limbs like a spider. 
A moment later, the chute opened, a green-striped starburst against the drab background of gray clouds. Mickey cupped his hands over his forehead to better follow the path of the glide. I told you, Tuna said excitedly. Look at him fly. Wahoo anticipated a clumsy landing, but the parachute came in softly and right on target, fluttering to rest in the center of the pond. Cut, the director shouted into his walkie-talkie. That was brilliant. Now let's go get him. All three airboats blasted off in unison. Nobody had time to fit on their earmuffs. Link was the first to get there. He cut the engine and coasted on a line toward the billow of silk. Wahoo could see that Eric had successfully detached himself from the parachute and was treading water. Link stepped past the other passengers and poised himself for the retrieve. Once he was within reach, he grabbed the straps of Derek's skydiving pack and hoisted him aboard. Everyone applauded except Wahoo and his father. Because it really wasn't Derek. It was a professional stuntman whose safari shirt had been padded with foam and whose hair had been dyed orange blonde to match that of the TV star. As soon as the stuntman peeled off his blindfold, Tuna stopped clapping and her face fell. The director called out, nice job, Ricky. Easy ride, said the stuntman. He was at least 10 years younger and 30 pounds lighter than Derek, and his tan looked real, not sprayed on. Did you know about this, Tuna demanded of Wahoo. Did you know the jump was bogus? Wahoo said, I swear I didn't, but he wasn't all that surprised. Okay, people, heads up. The director raised both hands, clasped together as if aiming a gun. The helicopter had looped back around and was slowly descending toward the airboats gathered in the pond. A large metal basket with a man inside was being lowered on a cable. The man was dressed the very same way as the parachutist, and his pudgy bare legs dangled through the canvas webbing of the basket. Pathetic, Tuna said. As the chopper droned lower, the gusts from its whirling blades churned the surface of the pond and made the lily pads flutter and shimmy. When the dangling basket was almost touching the water, the real Derek Badger stood up, tied on his blindfold, and hopped out. The helicopter shot straight up, dragging the basket out of the scene. Action, barked the director, and the cameraman in front of his boat resumed taping, zooming in on the now swimming figure. On cue, Derek began grunting dramatically with each stroke. Within seconds, he'd managed to tangle himself in the cords of the waterlogged parachute. Help, he gasped. The director responded with an enthusiastic upraised thumb. No, I'm bloody serious, Derek bleated. Somebody help me before I drown. Cut, Raven Stark shouted. Cut, cut. Okay, the director said impatiently. Let's cut. Mickey Cray looked quite amused when he turned to Wahoo and Tuna. His phoniness has arrived, he said. The director called a short break before the big scene in which Derek would trek alone across the sawgrass plain. Having seen the script, Wahoo knew what was coming. His father didn't. Yo, Mr. Cray, the director shouted. Can we have a word? The other airboat drew closer and Mickey stepped aboard. The meeting was brief. Mickey slipped into the waist deep water and motioned for Wahoo to do the same. As they waded through the lily pads, Wahoo said, they need a snake, right? In 15 minutes, how'd you know? What else did they tell you? They want me to make it swim up to Dorco so he can grab it. Pop, there's something else. Let me guess, Mickey's eyes moved back and forth across the pond, scanning it for slithery movements. He's going to kill it. That's right. And cook it for supper. So they showed you the script, Wahoo asked? Nah, they didn't have to. His father lunged forward and reached into the water. He came up empty-handed, saying, that was just a little bugger. Wahoo hadn't seen it. His dad's eyesight was astonishing. Obviously, the double vision had gone away. So what are you going to do, Wahoo asked? Just wait and see. Hold on, Pop. Not a cotton mouth. Mickey smiled mischievously. That would be intense. No, that would be crazy. You'll wind up in jail. Cotton mouths, also known as water moccasins, were foul-tempered and hard to handle. They were also highly poisonous. Don't even think about it, Wahoo warned his father. It's not like the man's definitely going to die. I'm sure these folks are smart enough to keep a snake bite kit in the first aid bag. But if not, Pa, that's enough. Hey, I was only kidding. You need to chill. Wahoo spied a small ribbon snake scooting through the reeds and started sloshing in pursuit. His dad told him to let it be. By now they were 50 yards from the airboat. Wahoo could see Tuna standing on the stern, close to Link. They appeared to be talking, although Wahoo couldn't imagine what the conversation might be. Whoa, Mickey signaled him to stop. There's a good one. I don't see anything. Be still, son. He went down. Mickey stared into the tea-colored water, ready to pounce. Is it a moccasin? 
Wahoo was trying not to sound anxious. Aha! His father exclaimed and thrust both arms underwater. He brought up a banded water snake about three feet long. Wahoo was relieved. Water snakes release a foul musk, but they aren't venomous. This one whipped back and forth, snapping wildly before Mickey got a grip behind its neck and dunked it again to wash off the stink. Four minutes to spare, he reported, after checking his wristwatch. Not too shabby, Wahoo admitted. He'd never seen a better snake catcher than his father. But now what, he wondered. wondered. As they slogged back towards the boats, Mickey didn't seem upset about what was supposed to happen to the newly captured reptile. Hey, let's call him Fang, he said. Wahoo shook his head. Let's not. How come? Because, Wahoo was annoyed. Why give the poor thing a name if it would be roasting on Derek's TV campfire by sunset? The director's grin seemed to split his sweaty beard. Super, he crowed when Mickey showed him the captured snake. Derek, have a peek at tonight's delicious entree. Oh, surprise me, said Derek, who was busy getting his tan refreshed and his facial makeup retouched. As soon as Wahoo climbed back into Link's airboat, Chuna grabbed the fleshy part of his left arm and twisted. Ouch! You said your old man wouldn't let him do this, he hissed. You promised! I didn't think he ever would. That's not good enough, Lance. Look, we really need this job, Wahoo said. Not good enough. She gave another sharp twist and let go. Derek entered the water gingerly as the helicopter rumbled into position above. Tuna leaned closely to Mickey Cray and cupped a hand to his ear. Where's the blanky blank? Huh? The snake, she whispered. Oh, you mean Fang? That's real funny. Wahoo's dad unbuttoned the last three buttons of his shirt so that Tuna could see where he was stowing the pretty rust and tan-colored reptile, which was now curled up peacefully. Nerodia Thessiata, she said. But that's not from Linnaeus. It's called Coluber Thessiatus. I like Fang better. You would. Wahoo slid, slid closer. So what's the plan, Pop? Hoping he had one. Heat, Mickey replied with a wink. Tuna made a puzzled face. What? Mickey jerked his chin toward the snake, which was resting against his bare belly. Heat is good, he said. Tuna shrugged. Whatever. But Wahoo understand what his father had in mind. Maybe it'll work, he thought. And maybe it won't. The director ordered all the airboats to move behind a nearby tree island so they wouldn't be visible to the camera up in the hovering chopper. For Derek's adventure to be believable, the Everglades had to appear empty and never-ending. This is from the script. A dark speck is moving ant-like through the endless shimmering marsh. Gradually, the aerial camera zooms closer and closer to our lone figure slashing and slashing through the dense grass. It's Derek Badger. Taping that part of the scene proved easy, thanks to the steady hands of the helicopter pilot and cameraman. The director had supervised from behind the island, using a portable video monitor and two-way radio. To the pilot, he said, another masterpiece, Louie? Thanks, buddy. We've got some weather moving in, so we're going to head home and refuel. Be back here at six to pick up the boss and Miss Stark. That's a roger. The director holstered his radio and turned to the airboat drivers. Okay, let's hurry up and roll. Derek was in a grouchy mood when they got to the spot where he was waiting. Truly a lone figure on the horizon. What took you so bloody long, he whined. There's a whole flock of buzzards waiting for me to keel over. The cameraman in the director's airboat eased carefully into the water. He was toting an expensive steady cam that allowed him to wade beside Derek while shooting, with very little motion or bumpiness in the picture. Everybody ready? The director hollered. And action. Derek said, wait, what's my line? Raven stood ready with a copy of the script. Your line is, I've been fighting my way through this swamp for four, possibly five hours straight. I've lost track of the time. Right, said Derek. Let's do it. Take two. Action. I've been fighting my way through this swamp for hours and hours. I've lost all track of time. When he got to the part where he was supposed to feel something swim between his legs, Derek stopped. The director brusquely motioned for Mickey to get into the water. Where's your scaly little pal, Mr. Cray? Right here. What's my cue? The line is, ah, there it goes again. That's when you release the snake near Derek. No problem. And be sure to keep your paws out of the shot, Derek interjected. Wahoo thought, uh-oh, here we go. Yet somehow his father remained calm. All due respect, Mr. Beaver, this ain't my first rodeo, he said mildly. It's Badger, not Beaver. 
Gently, Mickey removed the newly named fang from inside his shirt. Its reddish tongue flicked inquisitively as the snake coiled around Mickey's forearm. Hearing a distant rumble of thunder, Wahoo and Tuna glanced up at the darkening sky. The director looked, too. He clapped and said, okay, ready? Three, two, one, and action. Derek continued. I just felt something slither between my ankles. It was either an eel or a snake. Hopefully not a poisonous one. The Everglades is literally crawling with deadly cotton mouth moccasins. One bite, even from a baby, and I could be a dead man. Ah, there it goes again. Reptiles are cold-blooded, which means their energy and alertness vary greatly depending on the temperature. During periods of chilly weather, a snake's metabolism slows down and it becomes sluggish and sleepy. The warmer the air, the more active and lively it becomes. By letting the banded water snake rest for so long against his skin, a comfortable 98.6 degrees, Mickey Cray had made sure the creature would be wide awake and full of attitude by the time he released it back into the pond. He also knew it would not take kindly to being grabbed again. Gotcha, Derek crowed, carelessly snatching the snake by its middle. From that moment on, the script was in tatters. As Mickey had anticipated, Fang went nuts. First, it bit Derek on one arm, then it bit him on the other. It bit him on a knuckle, it bit him on a wrist, it even bit him on the chin. Crikey, he whimpered over and over, but he wouldn't let go. Tuna pressed it against Wahoo's shoulder. Wow, was all she said. The director was so stunned by what he saw that he forgot to yell, cut. Sitting behind him in the airboat, Raven Stark hunched down and covered her eyes. Meanwhile, the cameraman, toting the steady cam dutifully, zoomed in on the bloodbath. Derek struggled in vain to gain control of the twisting, squirming, snapping reptile, while at the same time trying to recite his lines. Looks like it's not, ouch, your lucky day, mate. His determination to ke kill and eat his supercharged captive was fading with each new puncture wound. Still, he labored to keep a brave face for his TV fans. Dinner! Derek squeaked unconvincingly. Then, ah! Neroda Fasica had found one of his thumbs and began to chew. Derek flapped his wounded hand and toppled backwards, producing a barrel-sized splash. By the time three guys from the crew had fished him out, he was spitting up pond water and the snake was long gone. Good fang, Mickey said quietly. Tuna looked at Wahoo, and Wahoo looked away, trying hard not to laugh. <laughs> All right, that was chapter 13. Let's see what happens in chapter 14. Derek Badger was rushed back to camp, where his bite marks, tiny but numerous, were slathered with antibiotic cream. He was so shaken by his battle with the feisty water snake that he declared he was finished for the day. Call the chopper, he said to Raven. I'm going back to the hotel. She informed him that the chopper was grounded in Miami due to bad weather. That's ridiculous, Derek said, just as a wave of thunder grumbled ominously in the western sky. They can't fly in lightning. It's too dangerous, said Raven. Dangerous? Huh. Have you forgotten who you're talking to? When Mickey Cray approached, Derek held out his arms to display the result of the reptile's attack. Mickey said, that's what happens when you go raw. But you're the wrangler. We're paying you big bucks to control these animals. Look, Mr. Beaver, stop calling me that. There's no such thing as a snake whisperer, said Mickey. I have some fat, sleepy ones back home that wouldn't nip even if you tied them in a knot, but you wanted wild and wild is what you got. Derek jutted his chin to reveal yet another U-shaped series of dot-sized punctures, which glistened from the medicine cream. This is all your fault, Cray. Mickey felt no urge to apologize. He turned his attention to Raven. So what's next? You want me to trap a raccoon or maybe a skunk? We're taking a break, she said. Good plan. That's some heavy-duty weather moving in. Derek muttered, thanks for the bulletin. Then to Raven, try the chopper pilot one more time. Make it fast. Mickey returned to his mini camp, swallowed a couple of tunic, tuna's headache pills, and stretched out on his sleeping bag for a nap. To prepare for the oncoming downpour, Wahoo and Tuna were staking a blue plastic tarp over the fire pit so the wood stayed dry. Just as they finished the job, a double flash of lightning lit up the clouds. A blistering crack of thunder followed. <clears throat> the airboat boats all took off towards Stickler's dock. Minutes later, the wind kicked up and the rain began to fall hard. Wahoo and Tuna scrambled into her tent and closed the flap, the squall drumming loudly on the canvas. Outside, another heron squawked between thunderclaps, prompting Tuna to remark, 
That would be Areta Herodias, commenting on the foul weather. Wahoo was mystified by this odd talent of hers. He said, how many Latin names have you memorized? I don't know, a couple hundred maybe. But why? Because I like to, she said. Every single species on earth has been classified that way by science. I'll never learn them all, but I'm going to try. Wahoo couldn't get over it. My brain hurts when I've got to memorize one little poem for English class. What's the secret? I told you, I study a lot. Tuna paused to wait out another roll of thunder. <clears throat> Before the bank took our house, I'd go into my room, lock the door, and start Googling like a fiend. Some nights I worked on insects. Other nights it might be fish or amphibians, whatever. I'd sit there and say their scientific names over and over again until they stuck in my head. Ugh, too much like homework. I couldn't do it, Wahoo said. Sure you could. If your old man was trashed out of his skull and acting like a maniac, then you'd find a place of your own to hide, she said, and something to keep your mind off all the craziness. <clears throat> Wahoo felt his face turn hot, and he thought he might be sick. He excused himself with a mumble and pawed his way out of the tent. Sucking raw, shallow breaths, he began walking nowhere in particular through the teeth of the storm. The rain lashed his cheeks, and soon his clothes were soaked. Fingers of blue lightning split the sky, but he never flinched. He just kept tromping like a zombie. Tuna's story had made him feel angry and guilty at the same time. Angry at her father for hurting her, and guilty because his own life was so good, so easy compared to hers. Wahoo's world was paradise, a day at a beach. Nobody ever got drunk and tore up the house. Nobody ever punched him in the eye. Get out of the rain, for heaven's sakes! What? Wahoo looked up and realized he was standing in the main camp. Raven Stark motioned for him to come under the big fabric awning where the catering service was headquartered. Most of the crew members had gathered there to wait out the storm, which had somehow failed to disturb a single red hair on Raven's head. What's the matter with you? She asked Wahoo. All we need is for you to get barbecued by a lightning bolt. Then your crazy father would sue us. Wahoo was still in a sad daze. Where's Mr. Badger? Over there. Raven waved towards a white hexagonal tent that was being puckered by gusts of wind. The entrance had been zippered tight. He'll come out after the thunder stops, she said. Here, put this on before you catch cold. She gave Wahoo a shiny blue jacket that had the Expedition Survival logo stenciled in gold lettering on the front. He peeled out of his dripping shirt and wrapped the jacket around his bare shoulders. On a nearby table sat a telephone in a black case that looked waterproof. Do you get a signal way out here, Wahoo asked? Raven said, it's a satellite phone, dear. I could get a signal on Mount Everest. Can I borrow it? She looked amused by the request. Exactly who are you going to call? Please sit down, young man. As she tailed off his hair, Wahoo groped through his pockets until he noticed the piece of paper with the number written on it. The paper was so wet, he opened it slowly to keep it from falling apart. Raven removed the phone from the case and turned it on. I'll pay you back, Wahoo said. No worries. This is a company phone. He handed her the number. It's in China, he whispered. Look, whatever it costs, you can take the money out of my paycheck. She smiled skeptically. Who could you possibly know in China? My mom. She's working there. Doing what? She's a language teacher. Fortunately, Raven seemed to believe him. She checked her watch and said, your mother's probably sleeping now. It's the middle of the night in that part of the world. Wahoo nodded. Yeah, I know. Please. The thunderstorm was sliding to the east and the rain had softened to a drizzle. As Raven dialed the number, she said, let me tell you a secret. I use this phone to call my mom back home every day, no matter where I am. Where does she live? Wahoo asked. From Raven's accent, he figured it was someplace exotic like South Africa or New Zealand. <clears throat> Fairhope, Alabama, said Raven. You sure don't sound like you're from Alabama. She handed the satellite phone to him. Ten minutes, okay? Susan Cray wasn't sleeping. She was sitting up in bed, staring at a bulky old-fashioned telephone. When it rang, she knew who was calling before she answered. Ever since Wahoo was little, he and his mom had shared an unusual mental connection that was almost telepathic. One day in kindergarten, he'd fallen on the playground and received a nasty gash on his head. Susan Cray had arrived at the school before the ambulance did, before, in fact, Wahoo's teacher had phoned her to tell her about the accident. Susan had confided to her son that a strange and anxious sensation had swept over her at work and that she'd known instantly that he needed her. The same thing had happened on the afternoon that Alice the alligator accidentally ate Wahoo's thumb. Susan Cray had arrived at the house right behind the paramedics, and no one had called her about the mishap. 
When she picked up the phone in Shanghai, the first thing she said was, what happened? Nothing, Mom. I just called to say hi. Well, that's very sweet, said Susan Cray, but I don't believe you. I'm fine. Pop's fine. The job is going okay. But what? I didn't say but anything, Wahoo noted. You don't have to, to. I can hear it in your voice. Okay, there's this girl, his mother groaned. Mom, come on. I'm listening. She sort of ran off with me and Pop. Sort of? Her dad beat her up, Wahoo said. Susan Cray was quiet at the other end. Her mom's gone. She didn't have anywhere else to go. Wahoo was still waiting for a response. When he didn't get one, he said, so we brought her along on the job. She's out here in the glades with us. Finally, his mother spoke. How old is your new friend? She's in my same grade at school. Your father should have called the police. He wanted to, Wahoo said, but if they locked up her old man, she'd be all alone. Mom, they live in Walmart parking lot. Get out. I'm serious, in a crappy old RV. Susan Cray said, the police wouldn't let her stay there alone. They'd find someone else to take care of her. You mean like foster parents or family? Doesn't she have any aunts or uncles? Wahoo said he hadn't asked. We'll find out. This wasn't the first time it happened. Her dad, he drinks all the time. That's awful. It's hard to listen to her tell about it. Wahoo heard his voice quaver and he thought, what's the matter with me? His mother said, she needs somebody to talk with. You have to be strong. I know it's just, just what? She's little, Mom. I don't understand how a person could do that to their own kid. He slugged her with his fist. At the other end, Wahoo's mother sighed. He could picture her expression. You can't make sense of it, she said, so don't even try. There are some seriously messed up people in this world. Raven Stark reappeared at Wahoo's side and tapped her wristwatch. He held up a finger, seeking one more minute on the satellite phone. Susan Cray was saying, when this job is over, you and your dad should take your friend to the police station so she can report what happened. But the black eye might be gone by then. They'll still believe her. They'd better believe her. Miss you, Mom. I miss you too, big guy. What's her name, your new friend? It's not important. Are you kidding me? Tell me. Wahoo braced himself. They call her Tuna. Susan Cray laughed warmly. Wahoo and Tuna. Maybe it's fate. I knew you'd think that was funny. Hey, you gotta admit, it's quite a fishy coincidence. You'd better go now, said Wahoo. This lady needs her phone back. Not before you tell me how your father's doing. Much better, Mom, really. Does that mean he's behaving himself? Well, Wahoo replied carefully, we haven't been fired yet. <laughs> the weather got worse, not better. One band of thunder showers followed by another and then another. Late in the afternoon, Derek Badger emerged from his private luxury tent and glared at the roiling sky. Still no chopper, he said peevishly to Raven Stark. It doesn't look good, she allowed, which was an understatement. The radar app on the director's iPhone showed a series of flame orange waves sweeping in from the west. The helicopter can't possibly take off or land in this mess. And how am I supposed to get back to the hotel, Derek protested. Sometimes Raven was surprised by her own patience. It doesn't look good, she said again. We might be spending the night out here with the crew. Predictably, Derek pitched a tantrum, cursing and hollering like a brat. He drop-kicked a plastic bottle of mosquito repellent into the woods. He dumped a tray of turkey sandwiches into the mud. He snapped off a dead oak branch and hurled it wildly, inconveniently slicing a hole in his own tent. Of course, he vowed to fire the helicopter pilot for insubordination. The childish performance ended abruptly when a spear of lightning, no more than a hundred yards from camp, Derek turned gray and retreated to his leaky quarters, where he cowered until nightfall. Dinner was served late during a break in the storm. Braised chicken, wild rice, buttermilk rolls, and a garden salad. The wondrous aroma was too much for Derek, who crept out of his tent and joined the others beneath the caterer's canopy. The wicks of the tiki torches were too soggy to hold a flame, and no one had thought to stockpile dry wood, so the crew members built a fire using folding chairs that they tore apart with hammers. After his third helping of chicken and rice, Derek croaked out a burp and asked, What's for dessert? Cheesecake, the chef replied, with Bing cherries. Derek beamed, hallelujah, bring it to baby. Firmly, Raven said, one small slice for you. She was scoping out his gut, a bulging orb that threatened to burst the buttons off his safari shirt. Oh, lighten up, mother, he said. After the terrible day I've had, I deserve to eat as much as I please. His attack on the cheesecake was a gross spectacle. Raven could only stare in disgust. 
the director and cameraman turned their backs on the scene. Someone broke out a deck of cards and a game of gin rummy was organized. By the time Derek finished gorging, there wasn't a crumb on the platter. His snake-bitten chin was shining from the creamy combination of cake goo and antibiotic ointment. He dabbed a paper napkin to his mouth and nodded at Raven. The scene we shot this afternoon, he said in a half whisper. Did you look at the footage? Not yet. Here's a thought. What if we said it was a cotton mouth that fanged me? Then we'd get boxes of angry letters from snake collectors and herpetologists who would notice that it wasn't a cotton mouth. Derek smirked. Come on, Raven, use your imagination. CGI? He was referring to computer generated imaging, a technique often used in movies to create illusions and special effects. Those little geeks in post production, he said, they can turn it into a cotton mouth or a rattler. Any kind of snake we want. Then we can shoot a scene where I'm injecting myself with the antidote and saving my own life. Raven sat back and folded her arms. You said we were done faking it. You said you wanted to put the real back in reality. Derek was annoyed to be reminded of his recent conversion to integrity. Whatever, he muttered lumpishly. The sky strobed, a jagged stutter of ice blue light. A ripple of thunder rattled a tray of silverware. Derek frowned. Get someone to patch that hole in my tent. Chop, chop. Fine, said Raven. Raven, why we're on the subject. Don't they make one of those bloody things with air conditioning? It must be 90 degrees in there. Just then, a piercing scream arose behind them. They spun around and saw one of the catering staff, a lanky middle-aged woman sporting a green hairnet, hopping frenetically. She was pointing at a long-tailed clump of fuzz that lay on the quivering cake platter. Raven stood up and gasped. What is that, a bird? Derek was standing too. Birds don't have big ears, he said. A rat? No, rats don't have wings. Approaching the platter, he leaned down to examine the furry, twitching intruder. When he turned back to Raven, he was grinning, just as I suspected. A bat! She said, Lord, that's a big one. Indeed, Derek's eyes twinkled in the golden flickering of the campfire. You must be sick or hurt, said Raven. I'll go get Mr. Cray. Wait, I've got a better idea. Derek motioned to the director. How long will it take you blokes to set up some lights? The director folded his cards. Seriously? Raven looked down at the woozy bat, then back at Derek Badger. Oh, no, she said. Oh, yes. He licked his upper lip. Let's do this. Oh, well, I don't think he's going to eat it. I hope not. But what do you think he's going to do with it? I can only imagine what that crazy man would do with a bat. <laughs> All right. So. We will have the next chapters on Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Talk to you soon, guys. Bye.